from former Congressional Budget Office Director Doug Holtz Eakin. Um, Doug, good afternoon. Great to see you. Look, there are a lot of Republicans who will back the infrastructure spending, you know, the way Jen Psaki was describing that, you know, we're behind and we need to catch up here. Fine. But they don't necessarily want to get behind all the rest of the spending. Well, let's first look at these process issues. Um, it, there will be the chance to use reconciliation one more time. There will not be two more shots. Uh, the notion that this so-called Section 304 uh, revision uh, uh, in, the, in the budget law allows them a third bill, I think, is just overstating the case. Uh, Optimism is running high on the Democratic side right now, but I don't think that's a realistic assessment. So here comes one more chance to do it on a, a party-line vote in the Senate, uh, but that'll be it. And when we turn to the substance, I think, I think you have some real issues with what's going on here. Um, everyone likes infrastructure, but from a first principles point of view, you first identify the objective. What are we trying to accomplish? You then find out how much it costs to fund it, and then figure out how to pay for it. None of those things are happening right now. Mm -hmm. We're just naming big numbers and saying, let's go spend it. And so I don't think you get, are going to get a consensus that it's going to work out very well. Why does his infrastructure get in? Mine doesn't. Why does her, her state get some? Mine doesn't. It's going to be hard to keep the Democrats together. I'm not optimistic about getting a bipartisan bill. Okay, let's talk about some of that funding, for example, um, that they're, they're mulling over here. I mean, the two options that I see, you print more money and you raise taxes. <laughs> uh, yeah, those are the two options. But uh, you have to think about this a little differently than the, the so-called American Rescue Plan, the stimulus. By the time this money hits the economy, everyone expects us to be back at full employment. So you're, not, you're now trying to take workers away from other jobs to put them out there to build infrastructure of one type or another, that, that's going to be a pressure on inflation. That's going to be a pressure on, uh, on the economy's ability to deliver that. And so regardless of whether you borrow the money mm. or whether you raise taxes, you're going to steal something from the private sector in the process, and that's not going to help growth. Now, they're going to say, we're doing great infrastructure. It's going to be uh, raised productivity. But experience is... When you hear the productivity number divide by two, and when you hear we're going to be done in three or four years, multiply by two. These things always take longer and deliver less than they're advertised to. And when you look at another $3 trillion on top of the money that's already been spent and the $1.9 trillion that just went through, um, and you think about you know, where we're going with respect to our spending and the future, um, not having a plan right now is definitely causing a little bit of pause for the market because it's also seeing interest rates, rates rise and it's really worried about inflation right now. I mean, that is what happens when you spend like this without having a concrete way to pay for it. It doesn't really add up. I mean, suppose you do three trillion in, in, in really good infrastructure, and you pay for it with three trillion in, in new taxes. On balance, you probably end up behind from an economic growth point of view. That's not a good trade, and they're then promising to make permanent big chunks of the child credit and earned income tax credit and premium tax credit and all the things that were in the, the American Rescue Plan. That's another three trillion dollars over the next ten years. So they will have taken. A federal budget that had a serious spending problem and a structural deficit, and they will have ballooned it by $3 trillion over 10 years. That's not a recipe for a calm market. Doug, I, I wonder about some of this logic that we're discussing here, because I'll give you an example coming out of the coronavirus relief package. You've got all these people getting stimulus checks, and they're essentially going on vacation. Yeah. They're spending them in Las Vegas, so sure, it's going to help the economy there, but that wasn't the intention, right? They're going to Florida on spring break, and that wasn't necessarily the intention. So you think about how this is going to play out, the unforeseen consequences with, result, uh, with respect to spending this kind of money, and I know none of us has a crystal ball, but your thoughts on uncertainty sort of, you know, what, what can happen if you take bite off such a big piece of this apple? The $1.9 trillion is indefensibly large. I mean, th there's no good analyst who can defend that number. And so you run a risk of some type of overheating. Is it going to be consumer price inflation? Some people think so. Uh, I'm a little more worried that up front, some people are going to take that money and, and stick it into their Robin Hood Act and start speculating on stocks. Or I we'll, think they we'll are. see it show up in asset prices. I, well, it, it's, it's going to flow into asset prices, and mm. uh, that's a recipe for a little financial volatility and not something we need coming out of this recession. Doug, great to see you today. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon.